everyone. Welcome to the evening services of the Benton Church. We're delighted with your presence. Glad to see each of you here. Visitors, if we have visitors, you are our guests. We hope you know that. Come back anytime you can. I have a number of announcements to make, and one that I failed to make this morning. This morning, Billy, gave, Billy Borland gave me a card and said, would you read that card today? And I said, absolutely. And then I promptly put it away and didn't do that. Sorry about that. So, Billy, here it is. Card's a very nice card. It says, God shows his love through the warmth and kindness of special people like you, church family. Thank you and God bless. Then they have written, Ed has written, Dear church family, thank you for the prayers, food, visits, cards, and phone calls during my illness. In Christian love, the Borland family. I told Billy if I failed to read it tonight to wave the bulletin at me back there and I'd be sure and do it. Have a number of other announcements as well. Mention those that I just mentioned this morning in prayer and uh, add a new one or two to it. Uh, Jim Johnson, the friend, friend of the Odoms, uh, passed away. His family and children asked for prayers. Charlotte Dillingham, uh, the three-year-old daughter of Lindsay, granddaughter of Brent, Bill and Belinda, is suffering from, suffered from seizures, and they're really concerned about her, and they really ask the people to be mindful of her and, and remember her in prayer. Sister Doris Harper fell Tuesday night. She's still in the Marshall County Hospital. She has a compressed fracture in her lower spine, and she's in a lot of pain. Room number 118. She'd appreciate visitors and prayers. Uh, Bethany Jones will have surgery on October the 6th. Uh, Shella Mae Collins' granddaughter, Leisha Gale Brummett, will have surgery Tuesday in, the Nashville, in a Nashville, Tennessee hospital. They ask for prayers in her behalf. In addition, her daughter, Trina Smitley, is in the uh, Lourdes Hospital in Paducah, and she's uh, suffering from kidney failure. Pat Jarrett, uh, we need to remember Pat in, her, in, her, in our prayers. We expect her to be returning home soon. And uh, that's the announcements that I have for those who are sick. Now, Billy, I read that already, didn't I? Yes, okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> hey, with me, you never know. Uh, again, to everyone who helped out with the service last Sunday evening out under the pavilion, thank you. It was a very good thing. Do remember that Wednesday evening services have changed to 6.30 p.m. Uh, going forward. This coming Wednesday and from now on, 6.30 p.m. Sunday morning and evening services will remain the same. There's a senior trip. See Bob and Jane if you can make it. Go on a tour of the land between the lakes and go eat roasted chicken at Cypress Springs. It sounded like fun. The bus will leave the church building at 9, 9 a.m. and return at 2. Do remember that the uh, office will be closed all this week due to the fall break. said earlier that Mark will be here. Some of the elders are in town. I think two. If you need anything, well, I call either Lonnie or me or Mark, okay? I think that's it. Jim, are you ready to lead us? Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord, a wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When 
and clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation is wonderful love. How shall with the millions on high? He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. 148, 148. This is a, a snappy little tune that uh, you could remember easily and sing as your work day goes by. <clears throat> I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps blessing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between the Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He keeps cleansing me over and over and over and over and over again. He gets sweeter and sweeter as the days go by. Oh, what a love between my Lord and I. I keep falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. 214-214 will be our song after prayer. Two, one, four. Why don't we stand for the prayer at this time and then remain standing for the song and the scripture that follows. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and all its many blessings. Thank you for the nice weather that we had outside this afternoon. Thank you for each person that's here. We ask you to be with all those who weren't able to be here. Ask, with those, ask you to be with all those that were mentioned uh, in needing of prayers, health problems, or whatever concerns they may have. Please be with us through this service. Be with Mark as he brings us uh, the message. And be with us the remainder of the week. Let us live as good of Christian lives as we can. And through Jesus we pray. Amen. Have you ever stood at the ocean with the white foam at your feet? Felt the endless thundering motion? Then I say, you seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the 
sunset with the sky mellowing red. Seeing the clouds suspended like feathers, then I say, you seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Have you ever stood at the cross with a man hanging in pain? Seen the look of love in his eyes? Then I say, you seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen? Jesus, my Lord, he's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes, he'll show it to you. Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst? Seen the face of Christ in your brother, then I say, you've seen Jesus, my Lord. Have you seen Jesus, my Lord? He's here in plain view. Take a look, open your eyes. He'll show it to you. Our song of encouragement is 927. We'll now have our scripture read. Our scripture reading, 2 Corinthians 12, 6 through 10. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You may be seated. Good evening. It is much cooler tonight than it was last week, and uh, hopefully we're enjoying the inside weather as opposed to last week when it was pretty warm. I enjoyed our time that we spent outside last week. I think it was good for us. Sometimes it's good for us to do some things different. It helps us as a family to, uh, to see one another in different ways and to have different experiences. So I hope you enjoyed last week, but I also hope you enjoy this week as well. The lesson I want us to study tonight, look at tonight, is the idea of prayer. We oftentimes talk about prayer and how it's the greatest blessing we have as a Christian. It's an opportunity for you and I to commune and to talk to the Most High God. The one who created this world in six days, the one who sustains all things and keeps us alive, and the one who will judge us in the last day, if you're a Christian, you can put your hands together, you can close your eyes, and you can pray and communicate directly to him. Now, you don't have to have that posture. I've had people tell me sometimes that the best prayers they have is when they're driving. And I always tell them, you don't have to keep your eyes closed. It's okay for you to keep your eyes open when you're praying in that way. And as you and I read in the scriptures, we see that they prayed sometimes laying down, prostrate before God. 
Sometimes they would stand and raise their arms as Moses did as he was over the army of Israel. And that was a good posture of prayer. Sometimes people would pray when they're kneeling and sometimes they would pray when they're bowing. All those ways are good postures to have when we pray. They're all acceptable. And we all know from the times in our Bible classes that God sometimes says yes, God sometimes says no, and God sometimes says maybe or later. And there are abundant uh, passages in Scripture which teach us each one of those. As we get started, I want to look over real quick to a passage, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7. You don't have to turn there, but you're welcome to if you want. And I want to use this passage as introduction for what we're talking about. We look there in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, and Jesus says there in the Sermon on the Mount, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall, seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone, notice that, everyone who asks shall receive. And the one who seeks shall find, and the one who knocks to him it will be open. Or which of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if his son asks him for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, or we might say common, will give to your children good things, how much more so will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask of him? Now, you and I read that passage, and you and I read passages such as James chapter 5 and verse 16, where it says, The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Or we read in Proverbs 28, which says, God hears the prayer of those who are faithful. And we look at all those prayers, and we put all those together, and it makes us have a very comfortable and a very nice Christianity, because we know that God loves us, and God's going to take care of us, and God's always going to give the best to us. And so we feel really good when we leave the church building. And then we have a diagnosis from the doctor, and it's not the one that we prayed for. And then we have a problem with our family, and it's not what we prayed for. And then we begin to lose our job, or we begin to not get promoted in our job, regardless of what we have prayed for. And then this happens in our life, and that happens in our life, and sometimes we wonder, well, where is God? And why hasn't he heard me? And why, if I'm a good Christian, and if I'm doing what I should, and if God is all good, and God is all benevolent, and God is all loving, then why are my prayers not answered the way that I want them to be answered? And that's a question of faith that each one of us has to come to. And for us, oftentimes it can be a stumbling stone or it can be an obstacle. Because we say, well, God, you're supposed to do this this way and you're supposed to act in that way. And God, I know how my life should have gone and you didn't allow it to go that way. Why not? Well, that's what our lesson's about tonight. You see, sometimes when God says no, we look at it or we should, as an opportunity. And we take a step back, and it's an opportunity for me, for you, to look at our life and ask ourselves a question, why would God say no? Why would an all-powerful and all-loving God look at my situation, hear my earnest pleas as I pray aloud to Him, why would He tell me no? This is going to be sort of like a CSI, like a uh, detective looking at a crime scene. And what I want us to do is imagine our prayer there being no, that no answer, being a body, if you will, maybe a little over the top. But as we think about that, I want us to begin to look around the room as a detective would. Maybe look for fingerprints, maybe look for DNA evidence, maybe look for clues here and there. Maybe look around and see, okay, if this is what's happened, take a step back and why would God have told me no? Why would these things have happened in this way? We're going to look very quickly at eight different things. And then at the end of the lesson, if I've got time, Paul preached to midnight, but preachers today are not allowed to do that. If I have time, then I want us to look at some other things very quickly. So why would God say no? Well, maybe first and foremost, when I prayed, I prayed on an improper basis. And as I think about that, it's maybe a technicality, if you will. But sometimes, perhaps, our faith is misplaced. Notice what Scripture says as we look at it. 
In John chapter 14, looking at verses 1 and 2, Jesus says, uh, you believe in God? Believe in me also. In my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Notice those first two verses. He says, if you believe in God, you need to believe in me as well. Looking at uh, Mark chapter 11 and verse 22. When Jesus prayed that the fig tree would be destroyed and it was destroyed, the apostles said, how in the world did you do that? And Jesus says, you must have faith in God. Now, here is the technicality, if you will. Sometimes I have faith in prayer rather than having faith in God. Sometimes I think, okay, well, if if I'm a Christian and I'm living the way I should, God's going to give me anything I want. And so we ask, like a selfish child, for this or that or whatever else it may be, and when we don't get it, we've decided, well, God must not exist. That's not what's happening. What we've got to realize is God is in charge. He is overall, and my faith cannot be in myself and my prayers, but my faith instead has to be in God. And just because I don't always get what I want, and just because my life doesn't go the way I think it should, or I even know it should, does not mean that God does not exist, nor does it mean that God does not care. It means that God knows better. And my faith must remain in Him rather than the prayers in which I have. So even when there's a no, I realize my faith needs to be placed in God and not in my own desire, not in my own plans, and not in my own intelligence, in my own ego. Secondly, perhaps one of the reasons why God says no is perhaps in my heart there's a sympathy with sin. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, a passage I referenced a little bit earlier, says the effective fervent prayer of a, what's that word? Righteous man avails much, right? The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. There are times where when I have sin in my heart, Psalm 66, verse 18, when I have sin in my heart, that God will not hear my prayer. Now, let me illustrate that. Uh, If you look over in Luke chapter 18 and begin there in verse 9, you see where Jesus gives a parable about prayer. There's two guys who come to the temple to pray. One's a Pharisee, one's a tax collector. You know this parable really well. The Pharisee begins to pray and he says, Lord, you're lucky to have me. I fast three times a week, I give alms, I show myself to be yours, I am holy, I am righteous, and I am good. God, you're lucky that I've decided to follow after you. And Jesus says, the Lord heard that prayer, but the Lord also heard in the corner a sinner, a tax collector. And his tax collector would beat his breast and say, God, forgive me because I'm a sinner. Now, in a world, that society of that day, they would look at that and they would say, well, you know, that guy is a sinner. They shouldn't even let him in the temple because of how bad he is. But look at how religious this Pharisee is. And Jesus tells him the exact opposite is really what's going on. And perhaps there's some times when I pray that I've got sin in my heart, such as pride. I've got issues going on in my life as far as ego. I've got the desires of the world so set in my heart that it blinds the prayers and my prayers can't even get above the ceiling. And perhaps there's other times where people whom I look down upon or people I don't realize are even faithful can pray to God because they've cleansed their hearts and they're righteous before God. You see, sometimes I'll receive a no because my heart's in sympathy with sin. And I've become so prideful or egotistical about myself that I'm no longer living the way that I should. Number three, perhaps God says no because my thoughts or my life is impure. Sometimes I pray with a selfish motive. Looking in James chapter 4 and verse 3, that passage says, You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your selfish pleasures. And you may spend it on your selfish desires. You see, there's some times where I talk to God and instead of wanting what God wants first and foremost, I want to please myself. There are some times perhaps where when I pray, I'm so engaged with what something will make me look like or just how righteous and good I am that my selfish motives have caused me to fall short and not be what God wants me to be. And sometimes those selfish motives can get me in trouble. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 18, we see the passage about Philip preaching in Samaria. 
And he goes to Samaria. This is before the Ethiopian eunuch. He goes to Samaria and he begins preaching the gospel and many people obey. And that very town, there's a man named Simon. He's a sorcerer. And he had, before he obeyed the gospel, convinced many people that he was someone great because of the great tricks which he could do. But his strength, his trickery could not compare to the power of the Holy Spirit to do miracles. And so when he obeyed the gospel, he went up quietly to Peter and to John. And he said, let me give you some money. And you lay your hands on me so I can do these miracles and make myself some money and show myself to be great. Peter looked at him and as you're aware of the passage said, may your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy these things with gold. And so Simon the sorcerer had to repent in order to be right with God. Now, I don't think any of us, especially in this room, are guilty of such things or go through such things. But how often in our prayers are we praying because of selfish motives? Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with praying for the betterment of ourselves. There's nothing wrong if we're sick to pray for healing. There's nothing wrong for us to pray in our jobs, for us to get a raise or to get a promotion or to be in a better way. There's nothing wrong with us for praying that our children will do better. Or that our parents will do better. There's nothing wrong with praying for physical, worldly things. But when we pray with a mind of selfishness, and we pray with our ego, and we pray with selfish desires, sometimes that can get us into a difficult situation. Closely related, sometimes we pray with a condemning heart. And what I mean by that is we live in darkness, John 3, verses 20 through 21. And that darkness takes us away from following after God. That darkness hides who we are and keeps us from putting God first. And when that happens, we cannot be who God wants us to be. Number five, sometimes we pray with an unforgiving spirit. You see, when we have an issue against another person, that makes it difficult for God to forgive us. This is perhaps, I believe, one of the hardest commands of the New Testament Scriptures is to forgive other people who have wronged us. In Mark chapter 11, beginning in verses 24 through 25, we see that we must forgive others so that God will also forgive us. You see, Proverbs 28 verse 9 tells us that if anyone turns the deaf ear to the law, even our prayers will not be heard. It's important for us to listen to other people. It's important for us to make sure that we don't have ought against a brother. I just enjoy saying that. That's a church way of saying something, isn't it? Ought with a brother. It's important for us not to have an issue or a problem that lingers. It's important for us to try to work those things out and make those things righteous and good before God. Number six, we read in Scripture that sometimes our prayers are not heard because of issues which we have in our marriages. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7, after Peter has commanded wives to submit to their husbands and to show love to them, and after he has shown that wives are the greatest evangelists in the family by the way in which they act, he turns to the husbands there in verse 7 and says, Husbands, treat your wives correctly. Treat them with great respect as a weaker vessel, as, as a fine china in the house, we might say, so that your prayers may not be hindered. There are times when we have trouble in our marriages that it causes us to have trouble with God in our relationships which we have. You see, we need to be sure that we're right with God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 as we look at this idea, I don't think it's taking it too far out of context. But 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5 speaks of those who are filled with hate and envy, who are filled with lying. And he says those who are Christians who do these sort of things have a form of godliness, but they've lost the power that's there. And so it's important that husbands treat wives the way they ought to treat them. And it's important for wives to treat husbands likewise. Number seven. Perhaps this is one we don't talk about very often. Perhaps God does not hear our prayers because we have turned a blind ear or a deaf ear, a blind eye and a deaf ear, to those who are in need. James chapter 1 and verse 27 tells us that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to hear the prayers of the widows, and the cries of the widows, and to help orphans who are in their distress, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 
We see in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 17 that God is the God of the fatherless and that God hears the cries of those who are hurting. You and I as Christians have a responsibility to take care of those who are hurting, especially those who are of our number, Galatians chapter 6. You and I have an obligation to help those who have less than we have and to be a friend to the friendless. And perhaps sometimes when we don't do that, God does not hear our prayers in the way that he should. Number eight, as we look at it, we see here that prayer sometimes can be an outlet for unbelief. That's a strange way of saying it, but let me explain what I mean when I say that prayer sometimes can be an outlet for unbelief. We see in James, beginning in chapter 1, looking at verse 2, where James says, Consider it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face fears and trials of many kinds, that you keep your faith. Hold to that faith, because as that faith is tested, you'll be found mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Now notice in verse 5. He says, For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea tossed to and fro, back and forth, and that man shall not receive anything, for he is an unstable man, double-minded in all that he does. James says here in this passage that we do not need to be a people of doubt. That we do not need to be a people who have unbelief. And we see oftentimes illustrations, and this could be a whole sermon, and it may well, well be a whole sermon one of these days when I get around to it, where Jesus speaks to the apostles and tells them, you've got to be a people of belief. You've got to be a people of faith. James tells his brethren at this point, he says that you must believe. That prayer cannot be an outlet of disbelief. And what I mean by that is there are times where we don't believe that God's going to take care of us, but we pray anyway. There are times where we don't expect God to do anything, but we go through the motions, and our Christianity and our faith and our religion becomes very empty. God does not want that. God wants us to put our trust fully and completely in Him. Now, number nine, which is our final part, which is up here. Don't get too excited. The sermon's not quite over yet. We see in a passage which Chris just read for us. Chris is a good scripture reader because he's done it morning and night. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we see a wonderful passage about Paul. And it's a deep passage that we can spend a lot of time with. Here we see Paul at some time, perhaps this is at his conversion or sometime else. He says, I know of a man who is caught up to see the third heaven. That's where God and the angels dwell. And he says this man was able to see things which cannot even be explained by our tongue, by mortal man. And he said, and when that happened, a buffet was given to me, a thorn was given to me, a problem was given to me. And it was a problem which hindered Paul's faith. It's a problem which hindered Paul's uh, evangelistic activity. Historians tell us that very likely Paul had great trouble seeing that he was one of these guys who could not see very well. As a matter of fact, in the early century art, as you look at the frescoes and the catacombs and other places, uh, one of the ways in which you can identify who Paul is is he's bug-eyed. His eyes are always about that big because he was always having trouble seeing anything. And so tradition tells us that it was blindness or very poor eyesight that was Paul's thorn in the flesh. Other people think that Paul may have had epilepsy. Other people say that Paul may have had this problem or that problem. Perhaps he was crippled by the problems which he had one of the times which he was beaten. We don't know, and I think God has done that on purpose so that each and every one of us can relate to Paul. But regardless, going back to 2 Corinthians 12, we see where Paul here speaks of a thorn in the flesh. Now here is a man inspired by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit to do miracles who wrote half the books of the New Testament, who prayed not just once, not just twice, but prayed three times for the Lord to take that thorn away. And God said no. God said no. And Paul was lucky because he was able to have a conversation with God to find out why Paul, God would say that. God said, no, for my strength is shown through your weakness. And out of your weakness, my mightiness shall be displayed. 
There are some times where God will say no to our prayers because I'm not in charge and because you're not in charge. There are some times when our life will go a direction which we do not want it to go and which we didn't expect it to go because God sees things better and more clearly than we see them. And so as we think about that, let's go ahead and travel through Scripture just a little bit to explore such things. We see in the opening chapters of the book of Genesis where Cain and Abel had a dispute and Cain killed his brother and then was exiled. We see where Eve prayed and was given a man. That child was named Seth. And Eve at that point said, God has given me a man. As you look at the closeness of that Hebrew text, it looks like Eve believes that Seth is the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. She prayed that God would take all the troubles out of the world. You and I know many generations later that that was not the end of the problems of the world, was it? We go a little bit later. And we see a man named Job, a man who is faithful and righteous. This man is so faithful and so righteous, he worships not just for himself, he worships for his children. Every day or every few days, he will sacrifice for each one of his children upon an altar. And what he's trying to do is trying to be religious enough for himself and his children in case his children are not religious enough. This is how righteous this man is. But after a conversation with Satan... God allows Satan to touch Job. And Job loses everything that's important to him. Yes, camels and goats. Yes, possessions and houses. But finally, even his children. And finally, even his own health, his own body, and his own reputation. And as he struggles with those three friends who keep telling him, Job, you must have sinned because these sort of things don't happen to good people. Job continually tells them and his wife, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. He continually tells them that he will receive evil and not just good because of his faith in God is stronger than that. He knows that God is greater than his prayers. We go a little bit later and we read about a fella or three fellas, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were told to bow down before a gold altar. And as everybody else bowed down, they continued to remain upright because they worshipped only the one true God. Nebuchadnezzar called them and said, not only am I going to burn you, I'm going to raise that oven seven times. You ever see in the south sometimes people get killed dead? They don't just get killed, they get killed dead. You ever notice that? that oven went up seven times to the point to where the guards around them were put to death. Notice what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say. They say, that is fine, king, O Lord. Even if God does not deliver us, even if God does not answer our prayers, we still will not bow down. We go a little bit later in Scripture, and we see a man named Jesus. The very Son of God, the one who created this world, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. We see him laid in the garden, praying, not once, not twice, but three times. Lord, let this cup pass from me. Realizing just a few hours, he'll receive not only the worst of physical deaths, the scourging, the beating, and the nails in the hands and the feet. But he'll receive a spiritual death as he holds upon his body the sins of the entire world. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. We see that he prays to God. This man who is righteous, this man who is God, prays that this cup may pass and God may find another way. But notice what he says in that final prayer. Nevertheless, Lord, not my will but yours be done. Now, that's just a quick overview of Scripture. And as I said before, I don't want to preach till midnight, so we're not going to look at every single instance where that happened. But I want us to notice very quickly what the righteous people throughout the ages have done. They've placed their faith in God and known that He is there. It doesn't weaken our prayer life. 
It does not mean that God does not love us. But it does mean that God is God. Each and every day, as his children, we should pray. And we should rejoice when God says yes. We should have faith when God says later. And we should continue to trust in him even when God says no. He has promised himself never to leave nor to forsake us. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. And the last words he said upon this earth to the apostles is, Lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the age. And so as we prepare at the end of this lesson to go into this world this week and be the shining lights and to be the salt of the earth, let us be sure that we put our trust in God. Let us be sure that we trust not just what he gives to us, but truly who he is in every circumstance. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the saints, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. If you've not partaken of the Lord's Supper today, then this is your opportunity to do so. So if you'll <clears throat> go back to the library area, someone will wait for you there to help serve. Let's turn and sing 291, the first verse only, and then we'll have <clears throat> our closing prayer. Verse 1. The great physician now is near, the sympathizing Jesus. He speaks the drooping heart to cheer, oh hear the voice of Jesus. Sweetest carol ever sung, sweetest blessing I ever done. Sweetest carol ever sung, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Bow with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful for the times that we have had to gather together today and to worship you. We're so thankful for the lessons we have heard. We pray, Father, that the things that we have learned in classes and in those lessons will help us to love you even more, increase our faith with you. And Father, we ask that all things we have done have been in accordance to thy will. Father, at this time, as we are gathered together as your children, there are those who are sick that need our prayers. Especially at this time, we would like to remember Bethany Jones as she is about to undergo surgery this week. Father, we pray that that surgery will be totally successful and that she may ret uh, return to her normal walks of this life. And we pray for Billy and Belinda's granddaughter. We pray, Father, that the diagnosis of the problem that she has will not be grave, that it will be treatable, and that she may soon recover and 
be active again as a young as a young girl. Father, we pray that you will bless each one of us, care for us, and we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. And we know that he loves us and that he cares for us daily. These things we ask in his name and amen.